recognize that tune and you know it's time for relics radio this is a family friendly show so the entire family can join us as we talk metal detecting and relic hunting you can call into the show at 270-495-0315 or join in the chat and post any comments or questions you might have and we'll get to as many of them as we can You're listening to Relics Radio of Southern Kentucky and Middle Tennessee. And you are live again on Relics Radio from southern Kentucky and middle Tennessee along the foothills of the Cumberland Mountains overlooking the scenic Cumberland River that runs through Monroe County, Kentucky and Sumner County, Tennessee. I am your host, Digging with Seven. And I'm your co-host, Tennessee Jeff. What's going on tonight? Seven, it's been hot, hasn't it, buddy? Oh, I tell you what, I about... It's got, it's got warm on it. I about had a heat stroke today. I... Uh, I could feel it coming on just a little bit. Uh, it was cooler today than it was yesterday, but the uh, wind died down, and there wasn't any wind, and it was humid and everything. And I tell you, uh, you know how you get to feeling whenever you know you've been there just a little bit too long, just a, a little bit droggy and everything. And so uh, I quit probably about dinner, hunted from about 7 till dinner today with the Equinox. I'm loving that machine, I tell you. I say I'm loving mine too, and then I mean you've done you've done real good in the last couple of days with it. So, I mean you pulled that uh, uh war nickel out of the ground right on right on top of that piece of big iron that you had. Well, it was laying it was laying on top of it. Sure was, and you haven't seen what I've uh, what I've got over the last two days. I've I've probably uh, I've probably pulled forty something relics off that little bitty house at. Uh, in the last two days, got an Indian head today, got uh, several wheats, and everything is just as sweet as it can be with a lead inch coil and great separation. I cannot imagine how good that machine's going to be with a six inch coil. That's right, and um, you can tell everybody you've you've hunted these home sites pretty good with the uh, uh, AT Pro and the uh, CTX, hadn't you? I've hunted them. The one that I hunted today, I've hunted with the uh, CTX, and I pulled one silver coin off of it, and it was uh, some foreign coin. I don't even remember now where it was from, France or somewhere. And that was really all that I pulled off of it, and I'd hunted it a couple of times. But, uh, man, it's a, it's a completely different story with this machine. I tell you, it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing machine. I'll just tell you that. And yeah, I mean, no more than I've used mine, I, I'm sold on it. And then if, like, six years from now, if I had the same uh, knowledge of it that I do the AT Pro, can you imagine? Uh, but, I mean, in six years, they're going to come out with something better. Technology <laughs> changes all the time. So here we go. I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it mean, is. I, I love it right now. I love it right now. And, then, I mean, that's my go-to machine right now, so. It is. Uh, it is mine right now. Of course, I know the AT Pro better than uh, than any machine that I've ever used because I've used it since it first came out. And I love it, but it just will not do what this machine will do. I mean, I, I have to be the first to admit it. But there are places, I guess, where the AT Pro is going to shine again. Uh, it's still yeah. a great machine, and I'm not going to get rid of mine. But uh, who we got in the chat tonight? No, uh, not yeah? at all. Well, I, I see. Uh, we, we got Mark Hoover in the house. Uh, there's Bill Hayes. Uh, we got Ken. I seen Woody down here. Uh, hey, there's Swansea. Hey, Swansea's in the house. Um, there's uh, there's our uh, regular old Jesse Rogers. He's in there. Larry Stevens. So we're we're really glad you guys are in the uh, chat tonight. We couldn't do this show without you. We and sure. And actually, we do it for you guys. So, but I mean, yep, you are. I love it, so. 
you are very special to us uh, that you would tune in and listen to uh, a couple old rednecks with a metal detector talk or tune in to our uh, YouTube videos and watch a couple old rednecks run around. It ain't all redneck tonight, <laughs> though, uh, because uh, we've got Brandon Stewart, Swansea searcher, in with us. Brandon, are you there? I am here, fellas, and you can't uh, eliminate the fact all rednecks. I do, in fact, live in New Hampshire, and that's about all we've got up here. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you well, what. With all the woods, I'm sure. Yeah. If you're not a lumberjack, you're at least a redneck. Yeah, yeah that's right. And if you're a lumberjack, you're probably a redneck. So it, that's the way yeah, it kind of goes. goes. Hand in hand. I tell you what, I went to a, I went to uh, one of my grandsons' uh, uh, graduation. Well, it was actually my grandson and my granddaughter's graduation. Uh, probably Monday night, Tuesday night. I can't remember. And I sat up in the uh, in the balcony of the uh, gym there and was doing some filming for the school. And uh, I looked around, and I tell you what. All the riffraff goes to the top of the building for some reason there. I told them when we got finished, I said, the people that I was sitting with, they had more tattoos than they did teeth. Oh, boy. <laughs> I hope nobody from Monroe County is listening to this show tonight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's just the way it is now. Sure is. Hey, uh. Uh, Swansea, Butch, and Heath, and Debbie, and them, you, you had a hunt with them. Tell us a little bit about that tonight. Sure, yeah. The guys came up, uh, and Debbie came up for the annual bone event, which is up here in New Hampshire every year. I think this is the 26th year, if I remember correctly. And uh, we had talked ahead of time about getting out on possibly Sunday, because that was the day of the seated hunt. And, you know, they were this was going to be their last day here, so they wanted to designate it doing something a little bit you know, more natural to our area. So I have permission for a home that was built in 1771. The house burnt down in the late 1700s and was rebuilt, I believe, in 1803. So the original home indent is still right close to the road, and this is a Class 5 road up here. It's not a heavily traveled road. So the, the, the second home is still standing. There was There's still one barn on the site. There are two more that are missing that used to be there, which is now an open field. And then there's a man-made pond on the other side of the home, and all of this property, including what's now completely heavily forest, is 230-something acres total. But we stayed in the main couple acres around the house. And I'll tell you, I mean, I'm used to New England cold and, and not great uh, conditions at a lot of the times when we go metal detecting. But these guys were troopers coming up from the warm weather country. And it was 45 degrees. It rained off and on all day and sometimes pretty hard at times. It was miserable, wet cold, windy, anything that you could think of as a miserable spring in New England. That's what we dealt with that day. And they were out there the whole time with a couple exceptions, Butch did get in the car a couple of times to get out of the rain. But, you know, Heath and Debbie stayed at it the entire time. And, you know, and some good things were found. I mean, not as much as, of course, we always like to do. And I've, I have been on that property once before, but we did find some pretty neat stuff. And, and it was great meeting them in person. I had met Butch uh, two years ago when he came up from Bone, but I'd never met Heath. And, of course, I'd never met Debbie. So it was it was nice to see them get onto some colonial grounds and and actually enjoy themselves doing it as miserable of a day as it could have possibly been and it rained I might add the whole time they were up here for the week. Yeah. And you found a good find, didn't you? Did you see that Jeff what he found? The uh uh mold for the uh pipe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a great find. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'd never seen one and actually I didn't know how they made the pipes and course after i seen that it was like well it, i mean it, it was really a great find so i mean and it was an incidental thing you know i mean i had been digging along the embankment there where we had seen some glass bottles you know more modern ones probably 40s and 50s and i got a terrible iron signal but again it was questionable enough on my at pro and Sure enough, it ended up being the blade of a hoe, but also it was a it was a square rock in the hole, and I didn't think much of it. I got it out of my way to get down to my treasured find of the uh, ancient rusted up piece of hoe. So I went to fill it back in the hole, and I went to throw the rock back in the hole, thinking, you know, piece of broken brick, not really paying attention to it. And of course, it was so muddy. Well, I stuck my thumb actually in the bowl part of the mold. So I cleaned it off, turned it around, and I said, that looks like what it what i thought it was is to be a pipe bowl mold but I, i've never seen one before i didn't even know like you just said jeff i didn't know how those things were made i just 
see the pieces out in cornfields or hayfields or whatever sometimes when they till and you know yep okay clay pipe and you move on well then i brought it over to butch because butch wasn't more than 15 20 feet away and i showed it to him and he's like I would say that's a pipe mold. And so Debbie conferred and, and he too, you know, so if I hadn't dug that nasty piece of iron, I never would have dug the mold. And the funny thing is it had to have been sitting literally on top of the, the hoe blade because the back of it is stained with iron. And of course it's made out of stone. So that wasn't my signal. And the front side had to have been facing up. But of course, just trying to get the stuff out of the hole, I never even saw what this square rock was until I went to put it back in the hole. And I almost put it back in the hole without even looking at it. And you know, you know, most of the time when uh, you find a unique find like that, you're just digging another signal. And of course, something like that's not re- going to ring up on a metal detector. And I know a buddy of ours, Will Johnson, he found a a great find just digging a hole at a colonial site. And then, uh, of course, that'll be on next week's video. And then, uh, but I mean, it was a great find, and you never would have found it with a metal detector. I mean, it just popped out of the hole, and there it was. So. Anything like that, I mean, it's it's a real great find. And, you know, his uh, wheels was an incidental find, too. And like Jeff said, you'll uh, see that this next Tuesday on uh, on our video that comes out. It was. Uh, it was. It was a great find, and I was able to uh, actually do a history clip on what that thing went to. But, uh, you know, me and Jeff, we are lucky enough to have some sites that had Native American uh, culture on it, and then uh, Civil War culture, uh, colonial culture before that, and then turn of the century. And a lot of times, you know, we'll dig clay marbles or arrowheads, or there's all kind of incidental finds. And most of my good incidental finds have been digging an iffy iron target. Isn't that unbelievable what the chances are? You know, you get that good, clean target, you pull out your coin, your butt, and your relic, doesn't matter what it is, and, and nothing else can be in the hole, but yet you go to pull out something that's very questionable as a signal and just piques your interest enough to dig it or something tells you to dig it for whatever reason, and that pops out of the ground. Yeah, it is. It, it's know, it, amazing. It is really amazing, and I know a lot of times I've dug down, and you, you hit uh, like a layer of ash maybe, a half a foot down and you know well it's not blow plow line but that's you find a, like a lot of pieces of uh pottery and stuff and then of course he uh actually will he was doing the same thing dug like a little trash pit and found that colonial ring and i mean the detector never would have picked that up i mean it was a small ring and it was fairly deep so i mean you just i mean if you if you start running the ash and like pottery the best thing just take your time and just dig I mean, just a little at a time, so. Yeah, and it was a, it was a nice little ring, too. Uh, didn't know what it was for a little while. I dug one of those uh, today, Jeff, a ring. I didn't know what it was until I, until I got home and cleaned it up. It was, uh, the band was broke on the thing, and uh, I, I was trying to figure out what in the world is that. I knew it was brass. I mean, it's not anything precious or anything, but uh, it did turn out to be a ring. So you never know. Uh Swanzy, you're an AT Pro guy like us, ain't you? I am. I have been for, uh, this will be my seventh year in October. Uh, I've been using it since, I got. I started with the Ace 250. Uh, I did well with it. I started in October of 2011. Um, went out, did okay. I mean, I, again, very new to the hobby. You pretty much dig everything when you start, which I'm still pretty much like mind as it is. Um, my first old coin I found, now this is before finding a wheat penny, any type of silver, Indian, anything. We got permission to a corn uh, hay field down in, no, sorry, potato field down in Northfield, Massachusetts. And I was there maybe 15 minutes with a couple of buddies of mine and pulled a coin out of the ground. And again, I don't, I'm not a coin expert. I'm not into collecting coins. So I didn't know what it was. I was pretty confident that it said uh, 1978. Well, then started to look at it, walked up to Jim. It was a 1778 mass copper. That was my first old coin with a metal detector. That Christmas, I got rid of it and got the AT Pro. Can you imagine <laughs> Jeff digging uh, a coin that old? No, uh, no, I couldn't. I mean, that's uh, that would be great. And of course, I, I, we have a lot of Civil War activity here, and of course, we dig bullets and stuff like that. But I couldn't imagine being up there and digging old coppers like that, and then the chance of finding something even older. So, I mean, that's that would be great. And like uh, the 
copper that he found when he was up there with you guys. Uh, he, he couldn't tell what it was, but I mean, after uh, some research, I think he finally found out, figured out what kind of what coin it was. But I mean, that's one of the bad things. You dig a copper like that, and you can see the outlines, or you can see a little bit of lettering or whatever. And you just stare at it and stare at it and stare at it, and it takes you forever to find out what kind of coin that is. So, I mean, that's I've dug a couple of uh, coins like that myself. So, and you know, it's all it's always funny in the in the field when you dig something and you don't know what it is, and you're already filming on the thing. Uh, it tickles me to death whenever I go back and I'm editing after I've done my research and after I've uh, examined whatever the relic is or whatever the Cohen is, and you know now what it is, how comical that it is whenever your your first impression of something. Have you done that, Swansea? I've done it more than I can count. I'll tell you, last year I was uh, a buddy of mine, Carl, who's the main guy that I dig with most of the time. We were going to a spot that they were logging right down the road from my home. And we knew that it had been a park that had closed down in the 1920s to 1930s. We didn't have an exact date. Well, they went in and logged a lot of it. So there's a lot of skitter trails going in and out of it. And we had been to a different part of that same area. And I found, you know, a lot of barber dimes, mercury dimes, um, some Indian head pennies and, and that type of sort, you know, stuff that was pretty much time period, late 1800s Indian heads, I might add, early 19th. Well, then we get over on this one skitter row, and, and I am dug a hole probably 10 inches down, and it didn't sound like a coin. It sounded like a button, but I get down there, and I see a shining of a silver eagle facing me. So I'm thinking, oh, sweet. Took out the phone, starting to take pictures. I got myself a nice silver quarter. Didn't know what it was. Get it out of the hole, and I'm thinking, well, the back's not shining. So I took out a soft toothbrush, and I cleaned it off, and come to find out it was a uh, War of 1812 United States Infantry First Regiment Officer's Coat Button with silver wash on the front of it. Goodness Man, gracious. That was great. <laughs> yeah, that was a beautiful that's, button. That was on the Butch's Magazine right on the front cover, actually. I say, yeah, I've seen that. It was a beautiful button. Man. Of course, then it was here, one we of don't things. have much of War of 1812 activity, but I've been lucky enough to find like seven buttons. Uh, of course, I guess that's just people coming back home and then like Later on, they'll lose them in their yard, or the uniform will get uh, thrown away. And I've got a site. I've found uh, three, um, let's see, it's a uh, artillery button. It's got the one with the eagle sitting on top of the cannon, and it's got the 10 cannonballs. And I yep. think the back mark is Crumpton, Philly, or something like that. And then uh, the same farm, I've got a uh, Navy uh, button that's got the uh, eagle and the anchor. So, and then a couple of, we'd found, I found one out at the uh, rock wall at one of, uh, uh, seven's places where his daughter used to live. And then that was the third regiment, I believe, wasn't it seven? It was a script. I, I don't know. Uh, I can't remember on what, it was a great button. I tell you. And we almost walked yeah. off from that place, uh, Swansea, because that was one of those multicultural things, had a rock wall going through and that's rare in our part of the country. But uh, we had found on uh, Historic Aerials an old house out there. Jeff found it. I just told him, I said, you know, we can hunt that property if you can find anything on it. And he said, well, there's a house on Historic Aerials. We can go check it out. But he said, I think it's like 1950s. And I said, well, we'll go back there and look. Well, we got back there, and there's a rock wall. And I said, oh, man, you know, we may have something better than a 1950s house. But all of the stuff close to the top of the ground was 1950s, and then the closer we got to the rock wall uh, was the older stuff, And uh, but we wasn't finding any older stuff. And then Jeff had a signal, and I was ready to go. And I told him, I said, he said, let me dig this signal. And I said, if it's not a flat button, we're going to go. And it was a flat button. And then we found several tombacks and brass flat buttons, and then he pulled that uh, War of 1812 button out. It's a great button, I tell you. And when you're starting to find the flat buttons coming up consistently and you've got the Tom backs, and like you said, you found the War of 1812, which you, you're probably right. It probably was a return soldier of some sort. We don't have the opportunity to, to find a lot of what we were just talking about before the show started. I don't find a lot of Civil War artifacts. I've never dug a Civil War button, but we do get general service buttons up here. We'll find those. I have found a couple of really nice uh, fully gilted uh, 
Massachusetts volunteer militia buttons from the Civil War, you know, with the with the front and back intact. I mean, we do find the incidentals, but I'm guessing, again, this is returning soldiers. We didn't have any Civil War activity in New Hampshire, and this is all very local to where I live. It's not like I've gone down to Connecticut or anything like that to find them. It's, it's They pop up every single year. There's no rhyme or reason. They can be in the same field as a mercury dime. It could be in the same cellar hole where you found Tom back buttons. You find that, and then you find it, what we call hunter's coins, modern nickels, pennies, and, and stuff like that out in the woods. It could have had a tree stand up in the air. But as far as finding the, the Civil War era stuff, there's next to none of that except coinage. I mean, we do find some of the you know mid-1800s coins, the fatty Indians, you know, obviously much older stuff. We do have a, a lot of 1812 activity that was up here, which was nice. And if you're lucky enough, you can find some of the Continental Army buttons as well because we did have a lot of that activity through here. Yeah, I'll tell you what, y'all have got a lot of history. Hey, guys, we're coming up on a hard break. Uh, Let us run this commercial break, and we'll be right back with you. If you want to keep up with what's going on in the metal detecting world, then you need to be a subscriber to American Digger magazine. Butch and Anita Holcomb are the publishers of the magazine, and have won awards for three straight years for being the best digger magazine on the market. American Digger Magazine is available in both print and digital formats, so no matter where you live in the world, you can enjoy the latest happenings in the hobby. You can get in touch with American Digger Magazine by going to americandigger.com or give them a call at 770 362 8671 and be sure and tell them that you heard it on Relics Radio. And we're back with our guest tonight, Swansea Searcher, Brandon Stewart from up in New Hampshire. And uh, I've got a question that I want to get into, but Jeff, why before we do that, why don't you give out the uh, call in number and if you've uh, want to call in and ask uh, Brandon a question or make a comment or something other, we'll open those lines up. All right. The uh, call-in number is uh, area code 270-495-0315. And if you don't mind, well, if you'll go I ahead. And, yeah, go ahead and put that in the chat. Mark. I didn't hit I didn't hit enter. <laughs> oh, I see it there now. I thought my chat had already locked up. Brandon, my question is, uh, how do you go about approaching a new site? Well, first off, I I started off as a field hunter. I mean, the first few years I I was metal detecting, I was exclusively doing fields. And now that could be public conservation land, uh, could be town land, state land. I never stepped into the woods. It was out of my comfort zone. And the first thing I would do, especially in those fields, is I'm, I'm a big believer in following the iron I'd, I'd get out there maybe look for a depression i mean a lot of these places are 150 to 300 acres so there's really no good way to start you really can't grit it off unless you're going to spend years doing it if i can find a concentration of iron i will spiral out from that spot literally walking in circles like i've lost my mind until there's no iron field anymore and find the concentration of it that's when you either put on the smaller coil or you really concentrate on that area really, really slowly, really carefully come at it north-south, come at it east-west, come at it northeast-southwest. I'm very I'm very thorough with how I metal detect. I, I do like to cover an area the best I can so I don't have any questions about missing something. So a lot of what I'll do is that. I'll find what I can in the immediate area, and then I will pick a spot one direction north or south or east or west from that spot go for 50 to 75 feet whatever it's assuming i've cleaned out everything in that direction i go to another direction and so on and so on and now since i've been doing cellar hole hunting i do the same thing except now i'm doing all my research in the winter time because i like to hike and i line up the next year's places to metal detect i do the same thing though i start at the cellar hole i follow it in a circle around the outside what I guess the Henry from the stealth diggers calls orbiting. I find out where the iron activity ends. And then I start again, North, South, East or West, all depending on which, which one looks the best at the time or where I get the most signals at the time. So that I'm very thorough with making sure I've covered every possible spot I can. And then after I've hammered the cellar hole 10, 12 times, sometimes, sometimes more, I'll look for something, either stack stones, like you said earlier, Loy, following a stone wall or even detecting along the stone wall. 
a lot of times you'll find a flat spot in the woods that doesn't look like it, it belongs in that spot. And I've done really well on those where it could have been an outbuilding that may not, maybe didn't have a foundation. It could have been a paddock for animals. Uh, that's my very next spot to get to. Then I go to where's the closest water source between there and the water source. If I don't find a well, it's usually a brook or a stream or a river. I do that very thoroughly. If I can find a well, same thing between the home site and the well. Another one is going between the access to whatever the class six road or the nearest entry point into where that cellar hole is. Cause a lot of these cellar holes are five miles or more into the woods where their class six roads aren't even existing anymore. So we'll do a lot of that. I'll go in between those areas. And this is why I metal detect alone most of the time. I don't have a lot of local buddies of mine that are willing to put this amount of leg on the ground just to thoroughly cover an area. But I also don't want to miss something. We uh, like to find springs, don't we, Jeff? Yeah, we do. And then, of course, we've done very well. I mean, you find a spring here, and a lot of them, they're a rock line. So you know that. Someone was there years ago, and then, like Lois taught me, you just look around the highest point around that spring, and then most likely here anyway, there's going to be a home site. I mean, we've done very well with it. And I don't think that it's uh, it's any different if whether you're in New England or whether you're down south here. When you find a spot, you're always looking for something that's out of place. You're looking at something that is an anomaly with the surrounding territory, aren't you, Brandon? Every single time. I mean, a big thing with the cellar holes into the woods, a lot of these I can't find on old maps. So, again, you know, following the stone walls or stack stones or even field stone that might be piled up in areas, I also look for a lot of the vegetation. You know, good signs around here, you'll find grapevines that are hanging down from the tallest trees. You'll find daffodils. You'll find lilac plants that don't obviously naturally grow into the woods. You'll find spots that, you know, the, the forestry up here is very, very dense in spots. And you'll come across a, a flat spot in the wood or a grove in the woods where the trees don't look like they're more than 100 years old. That obviously tells you that there was activity there or it was forested at some point, but there's no debris. That's my immediate next spot to go to. A, it's easier to walk through, too, but it's going to give you an idea of if there was any type of activity in that spot. There's 99% of the time always some sort of an iron field in those spots. And then I take my same approach I do in a field, and I spiral out around it, figure out where it ends, then go back in and really go at it. Probably a little over methodical, but again, I go north-south, then I go east-west, and I go on an angle, and I make sure I have covered every bit of that ground as much as possible. And the AT Pro, and uh, I know Jeff agrees with this because we love the AT Pro for identifying an iron field. And we run ours in Pro Zero, and our iron disc is at zero on that. So we absolutely hear everything. We don't wear headphones unless we just absolutely have to. And sometimes you get uh, in an area where there may be traffic or something, and you have to. But... uh, I can hear Jeff, he can hear me, and I love hunting like that. But I love the AT Pro on identifying the uh, the debris fields, don't you? Oh, it works fantastic, and I'm the same way. I, I do not discriminate out iron. I listen to my iron audio at all times. I know people get annoyed with it, and they say, oh, you should only turn it on if you're not sure if it's a questionable target or not. The iron is what leads me to the Connecticut coppers to the reals to the 1812 stuff. That is how I know exactly where people did things. This is where the activity was, you know, the bases of old trees. We have metal dumps around old trees up here. You know, I'll, I'll go through that and I will pull out 15, 20 things at the base of a tree and find some dandy buttons that were left in there or cufflink pieces. You know, I, again, I'm, I'm a very methodical hunter and this is why I do a lot of research in the wintertime. I don't metal detect a lot anymore. I get out once every couple of weeks if I have the opportunity. I've got a lot of other hobbies like hiking that I do anyway. So why not combine the two? And I want to put myself at the best odds when I detect as seldom as I do to get onto something old. I'd rather not go back to a school or a park where I started. And and a lot of ours, we've never really found a lot of silvers. People have been metal detecting around here since the 60s when it started including our local dealers there that have been doing this all along. So, you know, a lot of those spots are really hunted out for the easy target. I'd rather give myself the best opportunity to find something old, find something neat. And, and 100% of the time I am wearing headphones the whole time I metal detect. I, 
I keep one on in the woods and one off just because of, you know, predators that we have up here. Um, also, I, I'm very big on carrying a firearm when I'm metal detecting in the woods. I don't, I don't want to hear my machine's nuances of the squeaks, the pops, and stuff like that. I like the headphones. I feel I get a better, a better sound out of them, especially where I use the Grey Ghost. They've got an excellent sound quality to them. And I feel I can make a better judgment or estimate, I should say, on what I'm going to be digging out of the ground. I don't care what the VDI says. I go based on sound 100%. That's why we yeah. do, isn't it, Jeff? It is. And you were talking about the AT Pro trying to find the uh, iron fields and stuff. And, I mean, of course, I've got the Equinox, love it. But I think I'm going to have to use the AT Pro to locate the iron fields and then just mark it and then go in with the uh, Equinox. Because, I mean, right now I haven't used the Equinox enough to know the sounds of the ground. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm good with the AT Pro, and I know my AT Pro, and that's a lot. That's a big difference. And, like, I'm going to have to use my AT Pro to locate home sites, and then, like you said the other day, just kind of clean up with the Equinox. So. Yeah, and I, you've got that target separation that the Equinox is clearly showing because Heath proved that up at that home. I mean, he was literally 10 feet out of the front door of the second home that's on that property, the one that's still standing, and it was literally between the original 1771 home and the 1803 home, and that is the epitome of as trashy as trashy can possibly be in that front yard. And he plucked out that 1838 large scent right probably three feet from uh, the big tree in the front yard and 10 feet from the front door. It was just unbelievable how he did it and butch did it too and, and i don't know what butch uses for a machine i know it's a mine lab but he pulled out a uh, an indian head penny out of the same yard probably 15 feet away from where uh he pulled out his large scent so those machines and i'll give credit to both they obviously target separate fantastic because i have been over that front yard with the at pro not thoroughly because again I'm, i don't really do home site permissions i'd rather find them out in the woods but yeah, they, they sniffed them right out of the ground. I think Heath was all of eight inches, and I think Butch's was around the seven to eight inch mark, too. And they were able to hear it between the iron and the the house was recently sighted. So the flashing, all that stuff was unbelievable how well those guys did with those machines. It is a, it is a great did you, machine. Did you try it with the, uh, did you try the signal with the uh, AT Pro? I didn't. Well, no, I did not because Heath already had his camera out and was ready to start filming. I mean, I'm familiar, obviously, with what I hear. As in, I, I know I missed it. Let's put it that way, Jeff. I had been over that spot probably even that day, and the signals would have been great because the ground was thoroughly wet. Um, I'm guessing that my machine just didn't separate it from the, the square nails and all the repeated iron signals that was all over that front yard. I, I As much as I love my AT Pro, I don't think I would have, nor did I hear it. Yeah. I'm the same way on uh, one or two things that I've dug over the past two days with the Equinox. I don't think that I would have heard with my AT Pro. I just don't think that I would have because I don't think I would have uh, heard the war nickel that I found that had the uh, humongous uh, rusted square nail laying on top of it. You know, I just I think I would have picked up that nail and uh, not the uh, not the nickel. But I tell you, it was a it was a sweet sound. Let me give a tip that. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Mark Hoover, I heard him talking on one show one night, and he's talking about ground balancing the uh, AT Pro manually. And uh, you can, uh, you know, you push that uh, far right button and uh, and just raise and lower your coil. But then you can, when you let that go, you can push that button again and then use your plus or minus up there and actually raise that up or down manually. And I've started doing that on my AT Pro. After I ground balance it, I kick it up two or three more notches. It's a little bit more chattery, but I think I'm finding a few deeper things with the AT Pro by doing that. Have you ever done that, Swansea? Yes, that's that's what I've done from the beginning with it. Um, actually, when I met Mark Hoover out in Ohio, also uh, at a dig that we had a couple years ago, Mark and I were talking about that, and I I may be the one that told Mark about that because I've never used the automatic ground balance on my machine. It never really comes in right. Yep, Mark just said he learned that from me. I've never used the auto ground balance on the AT Pro. I've always done it manually, just like I, and you're going to probably curse me out on this one. I also don't use Pro Zero mode on my AT Pro as well either. I prefer the standard mode. I prefer the length of the tones, and I would, 
I would dare anybody that uses the same machine for the amount of time that I use to, to dig something that I wouldn't dig in their promo that I will miss in the standard mode because of the way I metal detect, because of how thorough I am. I've always, uh, I, I know my soil up here. Let's put it that way. I know my soil up here is going to ground balance between an 89 and a 91. When I went, went to Ohio before we started the hunt, I played around in the soil, adjusted my ground balance accordingly. It ended up being about an 82 to 83, what stabilized the machine. Pumping the ground, you lose that opportunity to correct what might be underneath the coil. If there's a small little tiny piece of iron, if there's the sm- slightest little flake of aluminum, even if there's aluminum foil under it, especially people who discriminate a lot, a lot of stuff out. When you manually choose those numbers, you can adjust it to how hot that ground is or how cold the ground is, as I call it. And you can really tune it into that spot. Now the woods might be a little bit different than the fields up here. So I manually change it to that. I never pump the ground with that machine. It just doesn't have as thorough of a, of a ground grab. I don't think as much as it does when you do it yourself. Huh. huh. And I've never really run my uh, AT pro in standard mode. Um, so, I mean, I may be missing a lot of things with the AT Pro that I should be, I mean, reading if I was in, like, standard mode. So, I mean, it, it makes you so think. We have a lot of guys who use them. What are you saying is the mm-hmm. difference between the standard mode and the pro mode? The pro mode has a much shorter tone. You know, so if you've got, say, square nail, dime, square nail, and they're all about the same depth, you really got to figure out if that machine is falsing or if you're really picking up on just that dime, especially when you're using a larger coil. I use the Nell Tornado coil myself. With the standard mode, if you're slowing your coil down enough, you're going to hear the iron grunt. You're going to hear the high tone. You're going to hear the iron grunt very clearly, very distinctly. You're not going to think that you're getting that false tone and skip out on that dime. It's a much longer tone. It's a much sharper tone. You don't get as much of that high-pitched noise like you get on a silver coin. You don't get that on the iron signals. You don't get it on the um, other little fragments of a square nail. I mean, I can almost tell you every time if I'm about to dig a square nail, I do it sometimes just to prove that I'm on an old spot. But I could tell you almost every time the difference between the standard and the pro mode tone separation that it's going to be a piece of iron versus a, a falsing high tone on halo effect, for example, which is what happens a lot too with the AT Pro. That's interesting. I tell you, huh. I I wasn't aware of that. But yeah, you're right. You'll get a falsing off of a uh, off of a piece of iron, or you'll get a falsing off of a nail that'll be a high tone. And uh, you know, I'll I'll put it in pinpoint and back off and come into it, and you can see that the target is not where the high tone was. And most of the time, that's going to be falsing off of a a nail or a piece of iron or something. Yeah, I mean, it makes a big difference, and I started off with using the, the pro mode because everybody that I, everybody and their buddy that around here, there's, there's about 23 of us in a local metal detecting club, and I'd have to say three-quarters of them use the AT Pro. We go to a lot of the same group hunts. Um, we have a lot of permissions that we have fields for or an old home site or something like that that we do once a year, sometimes twice a year, and most of them are all using pro mode uh, options. Now, if you talk to the local guys that I metal detect with and what I find compared to a lot of the other guys, I'm not saying I'm a better detectorist. I just want to know my machine better and give it different opportunities to maybe react a little bit differently to what's in the ground. I, I do very well with it. I do very well at these group hunts. Um, I tend to be the one that digs the most flat buttons, a lot of the copper coins, the most reals. It's also the thoroughness. It's the swing speed. There's a lot of factors that really go on that, but I had people when I went out to Ohio where, where Mark was talking about the ground balancing thing too. I had them using the same mode that I was using and trying with the auto ground, the manual ground balance and their results at the lunchtime break was a big difference on what they were finding prior to lunch and after lunch. Yeah. I'm going okay. to have to try that. That makes it a whole new machine. Yeah. I mean, we need to try that. And of course you've, I've got one ordered. I just need to pick it up. The, uh, little snake hole and Lloyd, you've got yours and then you you like the little snake hole on it don't you oh man i love it i sure do whenever you get into uh places that are well there was a you were talking about a house that burnt uh i've got a, a good friend here that uh, owns some land and his grandfather i think it was they had a tenant house and uh, these people would come in the in the winter time and live in that tenant house, but then whenever it came time to start planting or or working out in the fields, they would move off. 
And uh, so uh-huh. it was coming up winter time, and and uh, somebody said, "I seen this family, and they named them. I won't name them." And said they're headed your way, and so he went home and burnt that house down, just to keep them from uh, <laughs> because they cut all the cut firewood and everything there off of him, you know. But it is absolute solid nails in there, and uh, that's a great place to use that little snake coil. And I got that from Tim Henderson. And while we're talking about Tim Henderson, let's take a break and run his commercial. If your passion is metal detecting, then you know how much your success is based on the equipment you use. Let my buddy Tim Henderson of Murray Branch Outdoors in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, help you with that. Tim is an authorized dealer of Garrett, XP Deus, Tesoro, and micro detectors and supplies, and he is now an authorized dealer for Mine Lab. So, if you're looking to get your hands on the new Equinox 600 or 800, then Tim is your guy. Murray Branch Outdoors is not only competitive in their prices, but the service after the sale is second to none. Tim not only sells detectors, he uses them, and so he can answer any questions you might have. Murray Branch Outdoors also deals in used detectors, and he'll take your old detector in on trade when you decide to upgrade. So give Tim of Murray Branch Outdoors a call at 615-948-4611, and be sure and tell him Relics Radio sent you. And by the way, if you are wanting a new Equinox, Tim has some of those in stock. I know he's got some 600s. I think he's still waiting on his 800s, the last I heard. And he has Mm -hmm. uh, aftermarket coils for uh, a number of detectors. And Barb asked a question. Uh, Swansea wanted to know if you were using the nail snapper. Is that what you're using? Did we lose Brandon? I'm sure. Uh, oh, there we are. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there he is. <laughs> bathroom, yeah, no, uh, bathroom I, break. I muted myself during the commercial. <laughs> okay. Uh, Barb, Barb was wanting to know if you, uh, what coil that, uh, nail coil that you were using. Are you using the snapper? No, I use the, uh, nail tornado coil. I put it on uh, about three years ago when CWPP1 was happening, and I had just put it on prior to that. I'll tell you, I haven't had any issue, and this may have been a big difference at that home when Heath and Butch were up, but when I'm in the woods and I'm in the field, I like that machine, I mean, that coil, it target separates like a dream, it pinpoints like a dream, I don't use the pinpoint button, but I do a lot of the wiggle back, it's it's exactly where it should be every time, it's great ground coverage in a non-trashy area, Um, or even in trashy, I'm just saying you get to cover a lot of space, especially when you're in a 200, 300 acre field, the machine, that coil alone can, in my opinion, except maybe around a really super trashy nail spot, you know, around an existing home site or around a, an old home site. If you're taking your time and you're going slow enough, I'm pretty sure it can do everything the sniper can, except I think it's got better depth. You know, I've been digging things with that, including buttons, like we were talking about earlier, the 22 shell at seven, eight inches down. This machine will pick up the smallest little piece of a 22 head, the lead of it, at it easily 10 inches down. So, you know, I've been a real big fan of it. The stock coil hasn't gone back on since. I do have the 5x8 that you can get for the AT Pro. I haven't even put that back on since. It's been about three years consistent with the Tornado. Now, what size coil is that Tornado coil? That is an 11 by 13 I believe. Okay. It's not that big uh, manhole cover. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I, I've never used one of those, but uh, I know that... Uh, Jeff Ford has got an elliptical coil like that on his GPX, and uh, he burned us up at a Civil War camp with that on uh, his GPX. So uh, I I think that there's something to those elliptical coils that make them good, don't you? Yeah, I mean, and again, for me, it's a lot of ground coverage. A lot of times I can get to a spot around a cellar hole that there is absolutely no sound for a long period of time. To me, why would I want to swing something that's 5x8 or even 8x11 or whatever the uh, stock coil is for the AT Pro when I can cover a lot more ground, I can get to that iron faster. I mean, I've got a pretty broad swing anyway when it comes to metal detecting and a very level one, so I can get large outreaches off to the side so you don't just miss that coil off of a target by 
by an inch or two inches or something like that. I mean, it, it really picks it up and it really has great depth. I'm not going to say it's, it's going to be like CTX 30, 30 depth, but it's, it's an excellent coil. I know a lot of people that use them that swear by them. I just don't see any need in switching coils on and off the machine. Um, unless again, you, you want to get into that really heavy, uh, square nails or, or something like what the Equinox can do, which I still don't think it would equal with the target separation, just a small coil to me, it, it seems like I'm playing with a, a child's toy versus using something that's going to actually be useful. That's right. And then, uh, I know Tim and Ron, um, they use the, uh, tornado coil and, uh, they was talking about, it has great separation too. So, I mean, they, they swear by it. Yeah, the one thing I can say with the AT Pro, especially with the, the heavier coil, is the AT Pro was not designed to be a uh, user-friendly coil, meaning being light. It's, it's a very off-balance machine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm young now. If I'm 60 years old, obviously, I, I don't think that machine would be my first choice, uh, especially for a long-day metal detecting, you know, more than a few hours. Or when you're hiking in and out of the woods five miles and to carry the extra weight, it is a very coil-heavy machine to begin with. And it is very unbalanced, especially with a larger coil. And, and I see Jim says he loves the storm coil. I believe that is the big coil. Um, arm fatigue, I mean, that's another thing, too, that, that would just really start to beat me up after a while. Because, again, it, it, there is no weight back by the elbow. I did switch to the Anderson uh, carbon fiber shaft, which does make a lot of a difference. Plus, you've got adjustability on your control box. You can actually pivot it and, and have it facing you while you're metal detecting, as opposed to you having to look over the the arm cuff of the coil to see what your screen's saying or check the depth or anything like that. Huh. Well, see, before I got the uh, Knox in, I was thinking about getting that shaft for the uh, AT Pro. And, I mean, it looks like it would make it a little bit more balanced than the uh, factory shaft. And much, the, much more balanced. And the AT Pro is coil heavy. There's no doubt about that. And even with the uh, eight and a half by 11, uh, I noticed that Chris Himesoff said he has to switch from uh, his right arm to his left arm, you know, about halfway through the day or switch from his left to his right, whichever way. And I do that a little bit every now and then, but, uh, you know, I'm an old man, ain't I, Jeff? Uh, well, yeah, I'm not going to get into that, but yeah, you're pretty old. So. <laughs> you are your maternity pants when we go metal detecting. So. <laughs> Somebody said, uh, how long had, uh, had I been, doing civil war hunting i said well i got on my first battlefield but i did wait till the fight stopped and then i got out there and started hunting you know well see you look at the older i get the younger you're looking so i mean that's uh, that's something to say yeah yeah it is hey swansea uh, 80 years old is not that old anymore <laughs> I'm not 80 <laughs> years old. <laughs> I am 68, but I tell you what, I'm in. I think I'm in pretty good shape to be as old as I am, and uh, I can still go out and hunt all day and still in fairly good shape. Hey, uh, we've still got the lines open. If you want to call and uh, and talk to Swansea, uh, you know, get him while you can now because uh, he's going to be a star after this right here. <laughs> but it's two seven zero four nine five zero three one five. And I see that Jeff just put it in the chat there. Hey, Swansea, what have you not found that you think you should have? Oh, boy, that could be a really long list, but I'm going to keep it to the basics. Um, Well, a want find, for one thing, right off the bat, again, the Civil War bullet, never done it, never been in a spot where I don't think it would produce what I should have found by now. There's, There's one coin specifically. There's no reason why I shouldn't have found the two cent piece. I mean, we find plenty of mid 1800s coinage around here. Um, another coin that I haven't found is a half dime, not even the, the seated variety. I mean, I found first year seated dime, the 1837 before it had the stars and the, the arrows and all that. I've, I found a lot of coinages from state coppers, including Massachusetts and Connecticut. I found Drake busts. I found cap busts. I found I'm uh, sorry, Liberty Cap. I found every variety of large scent for the most part that you can pretty much dig. There, the half dime eludes me. I found plenty of half reals, one reals, two reals. I found uh, colonial silver shoe buckles and, and the tiny knee buckles. And I've, and I've dug so many things that are fantastic things, but there's these things that I see other people dig all the time. And I'm not GW button. I mean, that, of course, that's, that's a bucket list find for anybody up here. 
there should be more of them, especially to the spots I'm going. They date to the right time frame. One thing that I've, I have did find recently that I had never found before was a complete set of uh, 1700s cufflinks with a pattern on them, so that was pretty neat. The, the one thing I'm telling you, it sounds as dumb as it sounds like it could mean is it's that stupid Civil War bullet. I've got to dig a three-ringer. I've got to dig the mini ball. I've got to dig an infield. I've got to have those. And as minuscule finds as they are for a lot of people who find tons of them, it took me three years to dig an Indian head penny. And I know Barbara in the chat room could tell you to, to kiss it because it took her a little bit longer than that. But, you know, you can find a lot of really cool stuff. I just can't find the certain little tiny things that, to me, would make it my list complete. You know what I mean? Did you have a watch winder in that list? Is that what you started with? No, I have watch winders. I've got actually okay. a couple of them. Um, I dug one that dates back to Britain from the mid-1700s, that there's only three known of the variety, uh, which is pretty neat, too. Uh, that's what Mark actually just said in there. It's a, it's a naval officer's watch winder from England, and there's only three known to exist anywhere on in the Internet, and uh, one of them happens to be by my buddy Bill Marsh out in Ohio, and the other one was... Uh, some random post years ago on treasure net and nobody can identify it 100% except this one person that bill reached out to in England. So I found mine in New Hampshire. He found his in Ohio. And the other one I believe was found in New Jersey. So, yep. you know, this lot of that I found an 80 caliber musket ball. You know, that's something that's from a Brown vest that most people will never find. So my trivial find oh, yeah. is the, the three ringer, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I thought that you had. I thought that you had uh, was one of those that had that uh, rare watchfinder there. Uh, I remember yep, yep. hearing that somewhere. Uh, I tell you, you know, next time you're able to get down, or whenever you're able to get down our way, I, I guarantee you we can get you on a Civil War bullet. But but uh, you'd have to get us on a on a. Uh, Connecticut copper or something up there, you know, when we come your way. And I could kick myself because I was invited to come with uh, Butch and with uh, uh, Heath, and I just couldn't get away. Didn't feel like that I could. But I would, I'd love to get up that way and hunt sometime. I mean, that'd be right down my alley. I'll tell you, the one thing about metal detecting up here, unless you're going to go to a door knock, which I, I'm not a fan of, I don't want people watching me while I'm metal detecting, plus I can't be as methodic, mm -hmm. and I don't want to tear up somebody's lawn and, and make any type of mess or, or get the bad reputation by somebody driving by thinking that guy's you know, trying to uncover some buried treasure. you you got to put the legwork into it. I mean, a lot of what people metal detect that find the easy stuff, most of that's gone around here. I mean, there are a lot of metal detectorists in New England in general. Um, every easy spot is taken. The cellar holes that you can see for the most part when you're driving down a road and, and it's right there off the side of the road. I do a lot of mapping. You guys were talking about historic aerials earlier. I use that. I use Maprika. I go into the local town halls, like my town hall here in Swansea, which is where my nickname comes from has hand-drawn maps from the 1700s that you can't take out of the library, but, of course, you can take pictures of. So, you know, you really got to take those maps. You got to map, you know, do some mapping online. You know, LIDAR mapping works great. I don't have a lot here in New Hampshire, but I know my buddy Bob does up in Maine. You know, a lot of that stuff, you put them all together, but nothing is going to beat getting off your couch, getting out there, following a stone wall, just taking a hunch, taking your chances. I mean, I've done plenty of miles in the winter time, which isn't fun to hike in the woods as it is because of course it's not shoveled for you but i found cellar holes that i can then map on my phone drop a pin on google maps i use another app called map my hike which will tell me gps coordinates that's really the best way to go up here and i'm finding these spots and doing very well with them because i'm doing a lot more boots on the ground research than i am just saying hey I saw this spot asking this person permission for their uh, permission for their farm site. I'm out there going to spots that probably not many people have been to since the 1700s, except drinking a beer because I can go 10 miles into the woods and still find a beer can. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We can uh, And and you know, I mean, of course, down here, I mean, seven and I our best places we've found just looking for like a Civil War campsite. I mean, just accidentally uh, walk up on it, and then you get an iron debris field, and then you start finding flat buttons after flat button, and then, of course, that's how we find most of our good, really, really good sites. <laughs> Barb said Lloyd is really old, and he crawled up at Virginia Hill. I'll get you whenever I see you <laughs> again, Barb. 
<laughs> Jeff is a good researcher. In fact, when we first got together, uh, I, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I think I am a good video editor and a good uh, uh, photographer and, and filming because I, that's in my background. But uh, when me and Jeff first got together, he said, uh, you do the video editing and everything, and I'll do the, the research. And it's it's kind of worked out, of course. There's more maps down in Middle, Middle Tennessee that are available than we have here. But uh, nothing... Uh, takes the place of legwork. I mean, absolutely nothing. You just have to get out there and walk sometimes, and you come up on those good places. I I can look at probably my top three or four uh, colonial sites that I work here, early settler sites, I found looking for a Civil War camp that I have never found yet. I'll tell you, I've, I've run into cellar holes that I have missed by a short distance. And now we're talking, especially when it's heavily wooded, which is most of this area, but when the foliage is up, like what's coming up this time of year, I've missed them by 30 to 40 yards and walked right by them and found one that I wasn't even looking for. You know, that that's kind of a neat feeling. And I've got a couple in Marlow, New Hampshire, which is about probably half an hour from here, which is off an old Class 6 road that I've been looking for for two years, never found the correct one, but I've found several others on the same ridge line, but the ones that are supposed to be there that are actually on maps, I, I've either walked by it, I've missed it, or it was mismapped. I cannot find them anywhere. Do you find... Well, see, that's funny. You can walk by them, I mean, within feet, and miss that cellar hole. And then I know it's going to have a uh, debris field around it, but you can walk past that debris field and not even know it's there. I know one of my main camp, uh, Civil War camps, when I had a uh, my first detector, I walked through that camp five or six times and never found a bullet. And until I got a uh, the AT Pro, and then as soon as I got that, I started finding bullet just bam, bam, bam. But I w- I'd walk past that camp several times, and then I'm sure it's the same way with cellar holes. Now, when you're going through the woods and you're looking for the spot, are you metal detecting? Because I, I'm typically not. I, when I'm looking for a new spot, I'm never metal detecting. I'm backpacking it. So. It's it's going to be for a future hunt, which is why 90% of what I metal detect from May till you know, late December, early January, depending on when the ground freezes, that's all been found the previous winter, typically. These are spots that I found that I've lined up for the next year. I'm not going to bring out the detector in the snow, of course, and I'm not going to carry out all my gear on a hunch that I get to that spot. I'm patient enough not to worry about it. Nobody's going to get there between the time that I found it. And the next time that I get to metal detect it, 99% of the detectorists around here are not going to put that amount of time into the woods or the amount of research into the mapping to find it. I'm not worried about detecting it that day. Yes, I'd love to, especially when I can find them right away. But to me, it's it's just setting up future hunts typically. We well, don't good, uh, right? we don't detect whenever we go in constantly like that. I mean, we uh, uh, when we find a spot we will branch out from that because I don't, I guess it's the same in your area there, but we, we tend to find when you find one early settler site, there tends to be kind of a community. I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile, half a mile apart, but if you look for those uh, springs or knolls or uh, anomalies in, in the uh, terrain and everything, I've came up on probably, well, I found one by accident. It was above a spring, but then I found three more. And I'm just, you know, in those instances, I will walk and looking for a debris field. But our de- debris fields around our, what we call colonial sites here, actually they're just early settler sites, uh, they are very, very concentrated. And I think that it was the threat of Indians that kind of kept them close to home most of the time. In other words, the debris field is not big. Is it that way in New England? Yeah, it's it's mostly that way. Most of the t- the plots up here, when you start looking at the old hand-drawn maps, they're, you about nailed it. Most of them are about a quarter mile apart. Uh, that's pretty much what they were given for land grants up here. There are some that you might find a little bit wider, and then you've got you know intertwining stone walls in between them and such. We also can find, and if you start to really dig into some internet research, I found an old community that uh, in Chesterfield, New Hampshire, that there was a railroad that went through the area at the time, and there was an article how they used to use this as a tourist destination. There was there were ten homes and one large building, and I don't know if it was a town hall or what the large building was, 
well, there was a disease that went through and wiped out the entire town within a couple of years. It was never resettled. Now, to get to that spot, it's just under 10 miles from any direction you come in on that railroad bed. I'm guessing not many people are doing it, but I found this in an article in the Chesterfield little town crier paper. You know, there's only eight, 900 people in that town. I've been to this spot. I haven't metal detected it yet. It's a long way to pack in and do a full day's hiking. So I'll probably camp on it. And it's on, it's on a uh, state property. So there's other ways of finding stuff like that too. The, but these homes, you know, the quarter mile thing doesn't exist. These are literally probably, probably 150, 200 feet away from each other. And there's, there's, six on one side, four on the other, and then there's a large building a little bit further down. So you can find stuff like that just by digging into old town articles, you know, based on the history of the community. Um, we've got a lot of, in my Cheshire County is where I live, there's a Cheshire County Historical Society that has a book that's called um, uh, Monadnock Moments, which is the Monadnock region. There's stories about these old buildings on these old roads that Obviously, they don't exist anymore, but they had something to do with why they made the news back in 1785 or 1802. You go in and read a lot of that stuff. So that's another good resource to be able to get into as well. I wish that uh, I wish we had more maps here uh, in our county. John Hunt Morgan, uh, the Confederate raider, came through and burned our courthouse, and we lost all of our documentation from way back from the early land grants and stuff like that, you know, in our county. And so it's extremely difficult. Now, Jeff, what uh, what's the date on those maps that you've got out of Middle Tennessee there? See, right now the oldest tax map I've got is uh, 1878. And then you see a lot of home sites on that. And, it, I mean, there's a good uh, possibility that they were there in the early 1800s so i mean that's the map i go by and then um there was a couple other maps that i have found just pictures of them and it back in the uh i think it was like 1802 and of course it doesn't show very many home sites it just shows some of the old traces like the buffalo traces and uh indian trails and stuff like that and then, of course, I'm lucky enough to live here where I live, and we've got a Bledsoe Fort, uh, we've got a Greenfield Fort, and of course they were settled by Anthony Bledsoe and Isaac Bledsoe. Of course, they come from, uh, I think, well, actually, uh, Culpeper County, Virginia, and they come from there out here to settle their land. I think it was the mid 1700s, and then they built the forts then. So, uh, but a lot of the maps that shows them on there is just more or less Buffalo traces. And, uh, of course there's, I mean, it's, we've got one trace coming through. Everybody calls it Avery's Avery's trace. But I mean, and you go back and look at the, uh, like library Congress and all that, you can't find a guy named Avery that built a trace coming out this way. And, you have a lot of like historians they're like well no it's avery trace no it's something else but i mean that's that's the furthest map i've got of this area so the oldest map swansea our uh most of our early settlement was began somewhere around the late 1700s 1798 in earnest whenever the revolutionary war soldiers were given land grants that's the way they paid them and they came here to uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, and they, I don't know how much land that they got whenever they got a land grant, but, uh, you know, they got a few acres, 100 acres, 200 acres, something other like that. But that's most of well, our it was, old uh, history there. Yeah. The privates, they got 600 acres, and the uh, if you were higher ranking, you got a couple of thousand. I know uh, Anthony Bledsoe himself, he got 2,500 acres. And, of course, most of it, well, actually, my house sits on part of his land that he got in the land grant. And, of course, down here where I'm at in Middle Tennessee, it was settled a little bit earlier than uh, where Lloyd's at in southern Kentucky. So. Yeah, because it's closer to Nashville. And all of our stuff yeah, is closer to Nashville, yeah. All of our stuff is along the Cumberland River. Uh are your sites that you hunt, are they along some major waterway, Swansea? 
a lot of ours are like what you were talking about, a, a spring of some sort. We've got a lot of, um, of course, I live in a, a pretty hilly part of the state. I mean, I call it hills, but there would be mountains to the people in Ohio or Kansas or something like that. But we've got a lot of brooks, a lot of streams. Um, there's a couple of major rivers that run this way, the Connecticut River, which is what separates New Hampshire and uh, Vermont. Uh, the Ash Willett River, which winds its way through the entire county in this corner of the southwestern part of New Hampshire, um, there's water everywhere. There's not a lot of standing water in this part of the state. There's not a lot of ponds and uh, lakes or anything like that. But the movement of water is everywhere. So you're never too far from a mountain spring, a brook, a, a sizable stream, uh, a decent riverway. There's a lot of smaller rivers, too. I'm saying the two major ones are the Connecticut and the Ash Willett. There's no shortage of it anywhere. And a lot of these homes that we that I metal detect on are are 1,500 to 2,000 feet elevation in spot, but there's always water there. there. I took a picture um, a couple weeks ago when I was doing a hiking spot where I found a few cellar holes, and there's a actual waterfall that runs right down in front of three uh, cellar holes that are all right next to each other. I'm guessing one's the barn and two regular home sites. That's that's pretty much what I look for, too. And, of course, those can change direction over time. You know, the Connecticut River hasn't always been in the exact path it's in now. Same with the Ash Willet. And that's why I take road maps for granted, too, because the roads change direction, which is why you really got to put your feet on the ground and see how that changed relative to where these home sites are looking now. Yeah. Also, we've got a lot of roads named after Musterfield Road or Mill Street or Mill Road. A lot of those are hints onto what was possibly down there. Well, if there's a mill nearby, chances are there were home sites nearby as well. We got Missouri Mike on the line. What's going on, Mike? Oh, not much. You guys doing all right? We're doing okay. Everybody was wondering. Yeah, how's it going, Mike? He's uh, he's going hey, ben, through yeah. he's going through maps as we talk. I don't know what that noise is. <laughs> I'm out here doing some garden work. I got a question for Brandon. I was wondering, uh, do, do you hunt on, uh, uh, you know, you talk about hiking in four, five, six miles. Do you hunt on uh, government land and is it legal hunt on government or are you on private? 99% of what I do is on either state or town conservation land, uh, state forest in New Hampshire. You're allowed to, to hunt, metal detect, hike. There's no camping. There's no fires on most of these spots, but most of it in the state, a lot of people that have older ties, like say, for example, my town was founded, I believe in 1774. There's a lot of family names that came up from Massachusetts. My town is named Swansea, which was named after the settlers that came up from Swansea, Massachusetts, different spelling. Well, the old family name, they always had these huge land grants for two to 300 land uh, acres of land. 99% all of that was donated when these people's families would pass away or when the, the generations were passing away. So we have these huge state forests here in New Hampshire and these huge conservation lands. And even in my own town, over two thirds of the town of Swansea that I live in, I live in a town that's 45 square miles. It's got 7,000 people and two thirds of our town land is conservation pr preserved land. So 90% of what I do is either state or town land that's, public to everybody there's no posted signs none of that very little do i get on private land i just don't want to have to deal with the homeowner wondering what i found or harassing me or any of that stuff i take advantage of the fact that we have a big open air community out here and pretty much anybody has access to all of where i go yeah, that's great because where we're at down here i'm in missouri and it's illegal to hunt on the on the conservation land without a permit, but they don't even let you. The only thing you can hunt on with the permits the beaches that they have around the lakes. Other than that, you can't dig on the conservation land. They, get, they will give you a ticket here, so kind of limited well, I'll tell you, on the on the on that here. Well, I'll tell you. You just mentioned the the beaches. We're allowed to metal detect in the off season on the beaches of the what town? Uh, you know, we got some swimming hole areas. Uh, Surrey Dam, Otterbrook. Now, these are giant maintained beaches, and you're allowed to metal detect, but not between Memorial Day and Labor Day. After Labor Day, you can do it, uh, and before Memorial Day. But you're not allowed to detect on the grassy areas, the trees that might be around. You're only allowed the beach area for some strange reason. That's an ordinance in the state of New Hampshire, and that's huge fine. Massachusetts is now doing what you just talked about in Missouri, where you need a permit which is near impossible to get. You can't go digging anywhere on the conservation land. You can't go digging in town forest, state forest, or most public parks anymore. They're making it next to impossible in mass unless you're on private property 
which I do detect a lot in mass on private land that I've got permission for, I don't choose to go down there. A, their, their laws and regulations are ridiculous. Um, I'm, I'm a strong believer in my constitutional carry rights, especially where I'm going to be out in the woods. I can't cross the state line into Massachusetts with a firearm without a minimum of a year in jail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know. You know the the restrictions are getting uh, in some of these states is, is you know pretty hardcore. I mean they're getting ridiculous on certain things. You can't do much of anything in certain areas, and parks are getting off limits and everything else too. You know. And I'll tell you something about well, uh, on because uh, we've got a houseboat on Del Hollow, and it's the Corps of Engineers and kind of connected, I guess, with the Tennessee Valley Authority. And what they allow is what Swansea said. They've got a, a swimming area, a beach area. But you have to wait until the off season to hunt that beach. But I have asked them about, you know, metal detecting around the lake. And they said on previously disturbed ground, which would be where the water came up on the bank, you could hunt any of that. You can hunt in the water. You can hunt along the shoreline and everything. But you can't get up in, in the grass or the woods or anything. So I think that that's, uh, that's pretty well standard with, uh, with most uh, government type land you know that's owned by the government yeah that's how it is around here now the state parks you have to get a permit from the state but they give you a, 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 a permit from the state parks now, that's just for the beaches now if you get on conservation land that you know or federal land you know you're going to get a ticket if they catch you i know the guy that actually uh, got a ticket um i i believe the rule says you can metal attack but you can't dig anything i don't know you know, that way, well, but, see, that's yeah, what I've heard. But you're, but you're not digging nothing, you know. So why, you know, why metal tech? I, I don't understand that. But that's just, I think it's how it's stated is, yeah, metal tech's all you want. You just can't find nothing. So that's not and my we'll see here in the uh, Gallatin, the uh, local town we have. The uh, uh, Rotary Club went out to a area that, I mean, I can remember it uh, as m- growing up. My mom and dad used to take me fishing there. But somebody, they just let it grow up, and the Rotary Club, they went and cleaned it up again. And then the Corps of Engineers come in, and it was like, there was a million-dollar lawsuit over that, just where they cut some trees down to make it look nice and where you could get uh, start fishing again. So they just left it, yeah. and it's grown up again. So yeah. It's a mess, it's I tell you. Have, yeah, and state parks, is, really is. state parks here in Kentucky are completely off-limits. You cannot metal detect. Now, I've been called in and metal detected with an archaeologist on a state park that is next to us, uh, which is called Old Mulkey. And, uh, of course, I did a book on that, and we uh, were doing research together. But that's the only way that I got to hunt on that was with the uh, state archaeologist. And it worked out great. I mean, we uh, we worked together good, and I enjoyed it and everything. But you can't just go in there. They'll take your detector, your car, and and uh, your wife and kids, yeah, and, and kids. Yeah, whatever, <laughs> and whatever they you will. will have for the rest of your life. Oh yeah, yeah, they'll take it all. Uh, on, and on then we've got this uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I mean, you drive through oh, what's called Cage Cove. You drive through there, and you see all kinds of old home sites and like rock walls and stuff, but I mean, that's definitely off limits. So you can't, you can't get in there. So you better not even have one in the car. If they stop you. It's what I hear in, uh, in the great. That's Smoky what Mountains. I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hey, that's great pretty... call, Mike. We appreciate you calling in and, uh, and asking that question for, uh, Swansea. Swansea said that he was probably going to have to get off about, uh, 15 after, and we're approaching that. But, uh, All before, right, guys. Yeah, we appreciate it, Mac. Uh, Swansea, before you uh, go ahead, Mike, do you have something else? I just going to say, great show. Great show, guys. Okay. Thanks a hey, lot. Thanks for calling in, Matt. All right. All right. All right, guys. Thank you very much, Mike. You bet. Uh, Swansea, before you get off, I want you to tell everybody how they can get in touch with you, uh, YouTube, Facebook, whatever you've got. Well, I don't. I, I attempted the YouTube thing. Um, I, I'll tell you one thing. I, I'm terrible with editing and i'm terrible at self-editing the, the times that i've broken out the phone and started a video it's never been something worthwhile uh the times that i should have i don't um the times that i record and i've done plenty of recording believe me 
I just I just don't have the interest in spending that amount of time and effort into it. I mean, I, I do do the Facebook thing. You know, I am Brandon Stewart on Facebook. I am in a lot of the Facebook groups. Um, I do try to stay active. I'll tell you, one of the best things I love about Facebook, and, and I'm there constantly, is the ID me pages. I've learned so much about different things of metal detecting that I found out of the ground. Would have known from a piece of junk that you can identify on there or somebody can identify on there. And, and then the next time you dig one and you say, oh, my God, that's exactly what that was. It's just unbelievable how much you can learn from those ID me pages. Um, if there's something specific, you want to know how I run my machine or why I run my machine, send me the, the PM on Facebook. I'd be happy to answer it for you. Um, I don't do any of the other forms of social media. I just, I, I mainly just stick to the Facebook thing. I, I post what I find. I look at what other people find. I do watch way too many hours of YouTube videos. So don't think that I'm not watching people that are doing this stuff. And I appreciate it because that's a great time filler when I'm at work and there's nothing else going on. Um, you know, it, it's great to see. And, and I love to see what people are finding. And, and I love to, I get so jealous when I watch a lot of you guys that live down South, get to see the, Civil War relics come out of the ground. I don't know what I'd do if I saw a breastplate or a box plate come out of the ground, uh, you know, or a powder flask. I've never seen somebody, I've never dug a powder flask or any parts of one. That's the type of stuff that I love watching. And a lot of people say, yeah, I'd love to get up into to New England and, and see what the coins look like that come out of the ground and the old flat buttons and the, the 1812 stuff. And I, and I call it digger envy. It doesn't matter where you live in this country. If you're big into metal detecting, you're big into the history behind it you're always jealous of what somebody's digging somewhere else. And, and I think that it's true no matter where you metal detect. And if, and if you don't feel that way, you don't have enough passion for this hobby because I'm always curious about what these guys are digging in England. I see the guys uh, over in Australia, all over the country, and it's unbelievable what I, I get jealous of digging. And people are saying, oh, my oldest coin is a, an Indian head penny, and you've got reals and large cents and state coppers and blah, blah, blah. Yes, but that's that's more common up here. I want to find something uncommon to my area. I tell you, one of my favorite finds besides the 1812 stuff, that 80 caliber musket ball is still probably one of my most favorite finds I've ever dug, or the silver colonial shoe buckles, you know, that type of stuff. I, I don't care about coins. They weren't personal. They changed hands over and over again. I like the real personal things. Somebody owned this. This was somebody's cuff link. This was... You know, the one real that I did find that I really like was repurposed into either a button or a pin or something. It was a half real. That type of stuff means more to me. A hold copper coin is, is fantastic. I like that. I, it's dear. And I don't, I'm not trying to say I don't like digging the large ends. I don't like digging the reals. That's not the truth. But I do prefer to dig something more personal to somebody that was at that home site. I always, my favorite thing to find is anything military. You know, the, Civil War era stuff, the 1812 era stuff. You know, I dug uh, even it was I think it was World War II, uh, whatever they call. I don't. I'm going to butcher this. The ladder badge, I think, is what they call that. That's the type of stuff that I like to find, and it just because it was somebody's personal item. I never sell any of my things. They go in cases. I got to get down south with you guys. I got to get down there, and I got to put my hands on something Civil War other than the general service stuff that made its way back up here. Mm-hmm. Well, you got an open invitation. Well, you're welcome to have. That's right. And then we can put you on a bullet, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you guys probably could. I could put you on modern ones. Well, we find plenty of those, too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the pull tabs of the woods, the old shotgun shells. I mean, we dig a lot of musket balls, of course, too. But that uh, that, that eighty caliber brown best musket ball is still one of the neatest things I've ever seen come out of the ground. Man, that's pretty awesome. I've got a uh, spot here that it was a colonial site, and I found a prison to a uh, brown bass. And I wow. mean, it was it's in great shape. It's I mean, it's not broke or anything. I guess I don't know if they removed it from the gun. And of course, why, where I detected, I mean, I didn't find any other pieces of the gun, just the prison. And then out of that site, I, I found two prisons from uh, muskets, but one of them was a uh, brown bass. So. And I've only found but one of never those. Never an eighty caliber. I've only found one of those, and uh, it, uh, you know, until you hold that in your hand, you cannot imagine how big that that bullet is. Unbelievable! I thought it was a rock when I pulled it out of the hole, and there was no other signal in the hole. And I'm thinking this has got to be canister shot or something. But it is, it is solid lead, and it's got the uh, the right markings of what that eighty caliber looks like. 
it was at the same uh, home site, uh, cellar hole, that I found a couple of Connecticut coppers, but also my one and only, it was, this was a bucket lister a couple of different ways. I'd never found a counterfeit coin. I never found one of those old school wizard toys, you know, where the, the two hold thing. It was a counterfeit matron head large scent made out of lead, and it had the wizard two holes and a little star hole pattern in the center of it. So it, when you put it on a string, because I tried it, it makes almost a whistling sound when you spin it up with a string. We do find some of those. Uh, we find them made out of just about everything. You know, I found tokens that people have uh, done that with. I found uh, I found a uh, uh, a dandy button that somebody did that with. But you're a relic hunter. I mean, I can tell. Uh, that's you know, the, that's the personal stuff is the relics rather than the coins. We won't turn down any coins, but uh, you know, I prefer the relics. I know Jeff prefers them too. Mm-hmm. I sure do. No, I love finding the the best thing for me. I love to find, especially in Civil War campsites, is card bullets. And I mean, that's just it tells a story. Even I mean, they can be carved into anything. And I I have a lot of pieces that you would think come from like a chess set. And of course, I, I just love them. I mean, it tells a story, and somebody sat there and by fire or during the daylight and carved them bullets into something so we'll get you on some of them too swansea when you when you come oh, yeah. down this i'll way. tell you i i saw one of the coolest carved bullets and i'm guessing it was out of a musket ball i was detecting with a buddy of mine this was probably the second year i was metal detecting my buddy warren who lives in upstate new hampshire and he had come down for a hunt down in winchester uh new hampshire and he dug out a uh it's hard to explain it it's a i guess it was probably a musket ball but they turned it into a dice but it was never finished so it's got i think it had three of the numbers you know carved in with a knife blade on the tip and it had three of the numbers completed but the other three weren't so it would have been probably a game piece i'm guessing so they had to have hammered it down on all sides to make it flat because the corners were still partially rounded and they only got three of the numbers in it i'd love to know the story did he drop it and never finished it did something happen that he had to stop what he was doing at that activity you know, and this was on a muster field site uh, in Winchester. You know, this is where they used to meet up with the soldiers and discuss what was going to happen if the Indians came down from the mountains and all that. We've got a lot of those around here. Um, I, I'd love to know the story behind why that die was never completed. And those Man, are the, that is awesome. Those are the things that you that that make this hobby so interesting is when you find a relic like that. And you want to know the backstory, and there's no way to know the backstory of it. But uh, you know, you surmise what you think might have happened or might have been the cause of it, and everything. But we certainly do appreciate you being on with us tonight. We're uh, we've run you over a little bit here, and we apologize for that. But uh, I knew this was going to be no, a great it's show. Fine. I knew that you. It, were, it's been a blast. I knew you were going to be a great guest, wasn't he, Jeff? Oh, sure was, and. We really appreciate you being our guest. I mean, it's our honor. And then, of course, anybody that's our guest, it's our honor to have them. And then, of course, especially the people in the comment section, the listeners, and even on the archives when you listen. I mean, it's, I mean, it's our honor for you to be there. So, what, Jeff? Well, I hope I piqued somebody's interest in the AT Pro settings that I use, the the technologies, the methods that I use from you know how I metal detect around a cellar hole or whatever. Maybe somebody that uses the AT Pro consistently is going to go out there and say, hey, let's give this standard mode a try and, and see if Brandon is, is full of it or he really knows what he's doing or he's just a lucky guy. Maybe it's because I live in New Hampshire and I've got the history, but I'm going to guess that it doesn't matter where you live. If my, my biggest problem with the Pro Mode in any machine, any metal detector, why have a machine that has so many settings and options and you're going to stick to the same thing over and over again? I played around with mine until I found what works precisely for me it seems to work for a lot of other people that have tried it. I just can't stand the thought of you've got all these buttons, options, frequency settings on a machine, and you stick with the same thing over and over again. And it's usually the same people who never change their settings and say, yep, the spot's hunted out now. Well, try something different. you know. And that's what I did with my machine. I found that it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. I upgraded the coil. I went through my settings, found a setting that works for me. You, you just never know how that little bit of tidbit of information could really benefit other people. And you're exactly right. I mean, uh, you know, uh, jumping my m manual ground balance up two or three notches made a great big difference. And I'm going to try that with the uh, 
uh, in the standard mode and and see what uh, see what I think about it. I, I know Jeff is too, because we always He's love learning. Up. Yeah, always love learning. Brandon, I can't wait to uh, get to meet you and get to uh, share a, a, a site with you and hunt with you. I know that there's so much that uh, you'll be able to teach us when we finally get together up north or down south here, hopefully both places. But, uh, again, we certainly do appreciate you being on. We appreciate everybody in the chat tonight. And uh, as I, I always want to do, I don't always do it, but if you like podcasts, let me throw these others out here for you. Beyond Sight and Sound with Josh, they're on Sunday night and Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. And then Butch Holcomb has American Digger Relic Roundup on Monday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. All Metal Mode has a podcast on Monday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. History Seekers has a podcast that's uh, Heath Jones and Scott Duncan. They're on Tuesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. And then Hardcore Metal Detecting is on Thursday night and Saturday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. And by the way, we're on every Thursday night at 8 o'clock Eastern here on Relics Radio. You got anything else to add, Jeff? No, just uh, thank everybody for being in the comment section. And thanks for everybody watching the archives. And uh, thank you, Swans, for uh, being a guest. It's uh, our honor. It has been. My and, pleasure, guys. And thanks to Mike for uh, calling in. And with that, we're going to wrap the show up. So, guys, get out there and dig you some history. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Relics Radio. We really do appreciate it. Be sure and join us live each Thursday night at 7 o'clock Central Time, 8 o'clock Eastern here on Spreaker. Or you can catch the archive show at Relics Radio on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, or iTunes. Please take a minute and hit the like button and be sure and follow us so that you'll get notifications of all of our upcoming broadcasts. You can also find us on YouTube at Digging with Seven or Tennessee Jeff, or you can check us out on our Relics Radio Facebook page. If you'd like to get in touch with us, then send an email to diggingwith7 at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you'll join us next Thursday night, and until then, get out there and dig some history. Yeah.